my folks bought the farm here in 1956. So I've been here all but two years of my life and we continue to change and grow as the family changes and more members of it become involved. So it's pretty rewarding for me to be able to uh, have family around. And now with robotic milking, we're able to take an advance into the future and, and apply a lot of technology. It's funny, we say robotics and, and nature, you don't always go hand in hand, but what we've done is we've tried to create as natural of an environment as possible for these animals. They embrace the technology without compromising the qualities that make it a family farm. Cow comfort is their number one priority. They come and go as they want to, as many times a day, pretty much as they want to. There's some limitations, but um, they do it at choice. It's called a non-herding environment, so there are never humans asking the cows to get up and pushing them against their natural rhythms or schedule. The cows are just more comfortable and very happy and content, uh, quiet. They get to roam around and do what they want. And, uh, it's, it's fun to watch. You know, a cow in nature, they're being milked constantly throughout the day. They're being nursed on by their calf. Here on a robotic dairy farm, you have a similar process happening. The cows can go in and be milked as many times a day as they want. The stalls are all bedded with kiln dried shavings, which keeps them clean and dry. Um, and we just feel that cleanliness is pretty high up on the priority list. If the cows are happy, comfortable, uh, I, I think they're gonna, they're gonna do a good job making milk for us, make a good product. All the cows have collars on that have transmitters and the robots will interpret any data that that responder will give them. The information that's collected in the in the computer from from the chip or the transponder um, keeps updating all the time. We know uh, how much she's moved around in the barn during the day, whether she's doing it uh, going to feed enough, whether she's coming to the robot enough. If she's off on her feet at all, she won't move as much, and we know that she needs some attention. Or if she is in heat and needs to be bred, it will tell us that she's high in activity. You're not going through 450 cows to figure out whether you need to look at a cow. You can go to the computer and see it. It's a huge change for me. The transponder tells the robot which cow it is which then tells how much milk it's supposed, she's supposed to give and how much grain she can be given. Uh, it gives us the milk temperature and the quality of milk that's produced while she's there. We fortunately don't have to use antibiotics very often, but when we do, we treat them like we're trying to take care of our kids and we want them to be as healthy as possible, as soon as possible. And while they're on antibiotics, the milk cannot be sold. They normally respond quite well to what we're giving them and are then back part of the milking herd very soon. There's automatic alley scrapers in all the barns that run 24 hours a day. Uh, scraping the manure to a gravity flow system that then the manure ends up in the lagoon. We spread manure twice a year on corn ground and it's incorporated. And then on grass ground after we've harvested the crop and then we apply commercial fertilizer if necessary. Most of the time we can just use our own nutrients. We milk 450 cows. There's about 900 to 950 total animals here um, from young stock up through dry cows that aren't milking. So I've worked with NRCS the last three years on developing different plans and strategies to protect the land we have and to be able to apply the nutrients that are needed. We crop mostly our own land. This year about 450 of that is corn and 200 of it is grass. We try to put in very high digestible corn varieties to produce more milk and not have to rely on corn from the Midwest as heavily. Having our dairy farm in New Hampshire, we're able to produce milk here, bottle the milk in Concord and it is resold uh, right here in the Upper Valley and throughout New England. It does stay here and it's bottled here for the people of, in the area. It's nice to be able to tell them it's New Hampshire, it's, it's here in the state. Rendell and Karen and Nate and Emmy and the entire family make decisions to maintain the farm the way they want, the comfort for the cows, 
to stay up with industry standards and, and actually ahead of them. Technology is really here now, but it's the way of the future. But I think that, you know, if you embrace it and work with it, you're going to be better off in the long run and maybe still be here in the next 20, 30 years. Being able to use the technology will hopefully help to motivate the next generation to come and be a part of the family farm. If we didn't have the, the family farms in the, you know, like we do in New Hampshire, farming wouldn't probably exist. Working with my mom and dad for years and years has been uh, extremely rewarding and fulfilling uh, to learn from them. And I think they were always looking to the future and, and wanted us to be farmers and wanted us to, to stay here in New Hampshire, you know, that the farm would keep going in the family. Starting in 1956, they were ahead of their time in terms of being progressive and, and adopting new technologies, but remaining at their core family farmers. So for me, raising a family here, I get to watch these children have a peaceful, quiet lifestyle, but at the same time they need to learn from the very beginning what it means to work hard to put food on the table. They get to watch their father doing that all the time, but they also get to have him home to be a part of their life. So, you know, there are absolutely trade-offs, but I think at its core is the reminder that, that family strength is important and caring for your animals as a family is important.